coming up on episode 20 of the R Podcast, we got a couple more great interviews straight from R Studio Conf. I have a chance to talk with R Studio software engineer Javier Lurachi about the Sparkly R package and Apache Spark. And then I have a chance to talk with Garrett Grohman to get his perspectives on teaching R and about the highly acclaimed R for Data Science book that he co-authored. Plus, we'll wrap up with a package pick that can help make me able to use R even more in the podcast production. So, as always, we have one question for you. Are you ready? Welcome back to the R Podcast. This is episode 20. My name is Eric, and I want to thank everyone for joining me and listening in. And again, thanks to all of you who provided such positive feedback on the last episode, which was the beginning of our coverage of R Studio Conf. By the time I'm recording this particular segment, the conference has ended, and I am eagerly awaiting for the recordings to be posted so I can you know, revisit some of the talks both that I saw in person and of course the ones that I was not able to see in person because it was a two-track conference. But um, overall I was really happy with it and um, I'm already starting to put a lot of the things I learned into practice, especially with my Shiny app development and I'm also getting back into our markdown a lot more heavily now. Um, So without further ado, let's just get right into our interviews. I'll be playing them back to back. And then afterwards, I'll be talking about the package pick for this episode. So let's get started with our interviews from our Studio Conf. All right, welcome back, everyone. We are still on location at our Studio Conf. This is the first day of what I would consider the official part of the conference. We've had some very interesting talks spreading around the tidyverse uh, and shiny and interactivity and also with dealing with uh, big data and how how our our and our studio is interacting some of the newer systems to parallelize and make that um, and analyzing those kind of data a lot easier and i have the pleasure of uh sitting with with javier and you're gonna have to help me with your last name Uh, luraski luraski okay javier luraski from our studio so uh, uh, javier thanks for joining me Uh, thank you so much for having me eric yeah so why don't we um for those our listeners aren't familiar with you maybe you could give a short introduction about yourself and how you got started with using r and how you got uh, looped in with our studio. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thanks, Eric. Um, in general, you would think that I'm a data scientist, but I'm not. I'm a software engineer, and uh, that's my background. So I knew I know very little about modeling and statistics. And uh, but throughout my career, um, I worked previously on Microsoft and Microsoft Research, and now on our, on our studio. Uh, but I've, I've been focusing uh, through my career, you know, in helping people that have data or big data. Uh, analyze it, right? And uh, so I've been, for one reason or another one, I've been close to the uh, research community. And uh, I, I enjoy working with researchers and statisticians. So um, our studio was was a really great fit. Very good, very yeah. good. And um, obviously one of the bigger trends is, you know, data is coming from all sorts of different sources, but it's more the volume of it, whether it's, you know, streaming from the web or, you know, biomarker genetic data that's become much easier to collect. And so obviously there have been efforts to help spread the processing of that data across different infrastructures or different nodes in, say, a cluster. And so you have been working on the Spark We Are uh, package with our studio. So why don't you tell our listeners just a quick introduction to what uh, Spark We Are is all about? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, for those listeners that are um, not very well familiar with Spark, um, I, I think it's worth mentioning first what Apache Spark is. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, and um, um, we can we can spend a really long time talking about like the history of big data and big computing and things like that. But just to go really fast through it, um, you know, like when you think about projects like HDFS, like more than ten years ago, starting uh, in companies like Google, uh, just to distribute computation, right, and things evolving from HDFS to MapReduce and um, Today, like one of the uh, most used uh, platforms is Apache Spark, which happens to do the processing that Hadoop was doing 
uh, based on disks. Um, one of the main premises where the Apache Spark project started as was uh, processing stuff in memory. So, you know, like you've, you've seen some trends um, in general where the cost of memory has been getting reduced, like even, you know, five or 10 years ago, memory was really expensive. Right. But it just keeps going down in price where it makes sense to write and doing computations only in disk. Like now you can afford to have like decent sized clusters that are only memory based or primary memory based for doing uh, fast operations. And that's that's where Spark, Apache Sparks um, kind of like started and create a niche. And on top of that, it has a lot of great functionality for um, doing um, mappings and distributed uh, operations without having to be very involved the way that we used to have involved with Hadoop. So that's, that's just great to know. And, mm -hmm. and then the other, the other side of the coin is like, well, how do we do, um, how do we work with Apache Spark from R? And uh, that's where the Sparkly R package comes uh, into work. And uh, some of the motivations from um, creating a new package, right, Sparkly R, um, was mostly focusing focusing in on following the principles and philosophy that the R community have embraced. Um, so in general, uh, I'm, I'm sure your users are familiar with uh, the CRAN repository and, you know, how how packages are developed and a strong community behind R. And mostly, um, you know, uh, we wanted to have like those same principles applied to uh, Apache Spark development within the R ecosystem. And uh, we couldn't find really any any great pro uh, project at the time that, you know, would, would provide that for the community. So um, the motivation of a Sparkly R is provide that um, bridge between the R community and Apache Spark that will allow the same richness that the R community already, you know, um, likes and loves, which is uh, being able to do uh, common development between uh, in, in an open community, being able to release fast, right? Uh, people want to push things to CRAN and have their package uh, packages updated and bring functionality, bring new versions. And, um, and without being a closed ecosystem, right? So, um, you know, Sparkly R is an open, open source project. It's based on uh, Apache 2 as well, mostly to have compatibility with Apache Spark. And uh, Sparkly R uh, follows those same trends. And um, I, I, I think it's just gonna make a lot of, um, it, it's gonna have like a great impact for the R community to help help them move to big data whenever needed uh, with with a philosophy that they already understand that and that makes sense with their, their community. Right. Very, very nice. Very nice. And from what I've seen of the package and um, um, Javier just gave a really good talk on it here at our studio conf and the recording will be out hopefully very soon. So when it is, definitely check that out. Um, from what I can tell, what I like best about it is other than just setting up the connection initially and of course, assuming you have access to a Spark cluster, that you get to follow the same type of R code you would do in any standard small data analysis. You can use the tidyverse framework and it all just fits seamlessly into it. Right. No, that's that's a great point, Eric. I mean, um, going back to the philosophy, right? Um, when when you look at all the packages that we have in R, like most of them are very easy to use, right? And that was a bit of a challenge to develop with Apache Spark and specifically with the Sparkly R uh, package because uh, what you're really doing is installing like a whole cluster in your computer. But we, um, what we were able to simplify it to is just to really just one line of code that you can say, where you can say Spark underscore install and you know behind the covers will per perform like all these different types of operations to perf uh, download the uh, sources from the uh, from the Apache Spark um, uh, binaries and then uh, install them and configure them right and and that's just aligned with what um, the our community expects from a package like we we want to focus uh, we we uh, or me personally want to help uh, data scientists to focus on what they do best which is um, yeah, yeah sorry I'll, I'll repeat just that because um, there was a bit of noise uh, apologies for that so um, me personally I want to help the data scientists focus on what they do best, which is analyzing data and creating models. And uh, I really don't want to see them like spending time installing packages uh, that you know have a lot of dependencies, or um, you know, like where they need to know, know more than they should in order to be productive. And um, that's that's one of the motivations as well. That um, uh, little by little, hopefully, uh, we're simplifying data scientists' life uh, with the functionality that we add in Sparkly R. Yeah, so like let them concentrate on the problem at hand, not about administering all the, the, the background tools that it, they need to even get to that point then. Right, Very and with, with big data, the reality and, you know, big compute is that uh, there's still a lot of 
neat and greedy stuff that you need to optimize on your Spark cluster. It's not necessarily about optimizing Sparkly R because Sparkly R is that interface to, to Apache Spark, but there's still like so much work that we could help on the future to not just uh, help you set up your local environment, but also, you know, perhaps like help you, you know, uh, understand better like what things need to get uh, optimized on your cluster when you're running at scale. And uh, that's, I think, uh, probably today's state of the art um, in, in different companies and uh, organizations that uh, still require a lot of manual tuning that uh, hopefully one day we're going to see data scientists just not even worrying about how many machines they um, they, they need or what's the size, the type, like uh, hopefully one day we will see them just uh, pushing their models and the model and the engine behind it, whatever we call it, maybe maybe it will be Apache Spark, maybe it will be something else. Um, somehow they need to be able to um, push their model and not even worry about like what's the hardware behind that it's executing that. And, and we're still a little bit... Um, behind that, I think, as, as a community. Okay. But like, really looking forward to kind of like um, getting getting to that point. Yeah, I think we're well on the way, and this is just kind of the start of, of that process. So, also, it's been it's been great chatting with you. Do you um, have any other uh, things you want to share for our listeners uh, before we close out here? Yeah, maybe it's worth uh, mentioning just uh, kind of like, I know that it's hard because your listeners are kind of listening, actually, right? Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I'll just mention a couple of resources that, uh, yeah, for, yeah, for those for those of, of your um, listeners that want to go deeper, right? Uh, so first of all, like I would start with uh, spark.rstudio.com. Uh, that's kind of like our documentation side where you can get like the full overview and also go, go all the way to walk downs on how to install the clusters on EMR, Cloudera, you can see examples. Uh, you can actually see running examples of Spark on, on the examples page without having to install anything and do filtering with Shiny. So that's just a great resource to get like um, you'll, yourself familiarized with, uh, with the tools. And uh, definitely once you start making progress and installing your clusters locally or in your organization, uh, you probably want to use our GitHub page. Um, so, you know, if you go to github.com slash our studio slash sparkly R, uh, that's a great place to open issues and um, ask questions. Uh, currently, you know, it, the community is still growing, but uh, we're keeping everything on, on GitHub. So um, that would be the best best place to reach us out and uh, for us to, to help. But um, yeah, apart from that, uh, thanks, Eric, for having me. Oh, yeah. well, it's been a pleasure. I mean, yeah. It's my first time meeting you and um, your colleagues at our studio spoke very highly of you. So I'm very impressed. So we'll put the links you just said in the show notes so they can easily go to the website and be able to click all that. But um, Javier, thanks so much for joining me. And um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you again. Okay. All the best. Thanks a lot. All right, everyone, we will be right back. All right, welcome back, everyone. We are again on location at our studio conf. We are on the second day, actually pretty close to wrapping things up. While we had a spare moment during an afternoon break, I was lucky enough to corral one of my um, favorite people to follow at our studio, uh, Garrett Grohman. Thank you so much for joining me, Garrett. Thank you very much for having me. This yes. Is... Um, so, th yeah, again, thanks for joining me. So um, just give me kind of your perspective of how our studio conf has gone so far. Well, it's gone great. These sorts of get togethers are always very energizing. You know, working in the art community, you meet a lot of people over email and you, s you see lots of people mm -hmm. doing interesting things that you're following, but you don't necessarily get to see them all at the same time or in right. the same place. Right. Uh, and everything just builds this crescendo when you do it all in two days, like we're doing right here. Yeah, yeah. And it's definitely bigger in scope than what we had last year with Shiny DevCon. So I imagine there's been more challenges to get everything kind of lined up. But at the same time, I think the information has been really, really awesome to share. Yeah, in a way, it's a shame to lose that intimacy we had with a small group. But yeah, this is just so surreal. The the place we're in right now is pretty amazing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is the, the Gaylord uh, Orlando Resort. I've never seen anything like this. So it's pretty amazing. And then last night, we were able to go to Universal Studios and rent out all of Harry Potter World because there yeah. was enough of us to do that. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that will ever happen again. So <laughs> definitely enjoy it while we can. So um, just uh, very recently, uh, before the conference, um, R for Data Science, uh, the book that you co-authored with uh, Hadley Wickham, has now been published by O'Reilly. It's an excellent book. So thank you again for all your work on that and it kind of is a new ex another example of this kind of new publishing paradigm where you develop the book in the open but yet you're still um, releasing a printed form of it and so do you think this is a trend that's going to continue and how's that uh, paradigm been for you guys at our studio 
Yes, I think this is something that will stay around for a while, at least in this niche. You know, Dan Brown's probably not going to release his books in the open, but <laughs> when it comes to learning, especially learning something open source, uh, it's nice to have that online reference to go back to and check things out. But right, right. if people are like me, they still want a hard physical copy in their hands to flip through, to annotate, right, to look right. at. Right, mm -hmm. And O'Reilly was kind enough to let us publish the book online. We got a lot of feedback even before the book was finished about improving it. And so when we went into the editing process, it was already very well edited. That was a very smooth transition. Mm -hmm. And then it was already very well marketed as far as I could tell because people knew all along that it was coming. Yep. And as soon as it was ready, people started buying the book. And I think the response overwhelmed O'Reilly actually. Uh, the, the book seems to be doing very, very well even though it's completely free online. Yes, I mean, that may be counterintuitive to a lot of people, but I think it just speaks to the fact that we're kind of thinking similar. We, we love the fact that it's down in the open, but then we can get a printed copy and take it with us and read it like we used to do when we were kids. So <laughs> very, very good work there. So, um, so those of you, I'm sure, are very familiar. Garrett's done a lot of webinars for various concepts on processing data. Um, our markdown, he's done even things with Shiny as well. Um, so you've, you've had a lot of experience in many different areas of analysis, whether it's communicating or getting to the right data, so to speak. So out of all the things that you've taught via these webinars or short courses, what kind of areas have been the most challenging to teach to others um, about R? Well, I find that since R is designed to do data science or statistics, and data touches the real world, in some ways, it's easy to teach because it's concrete. You could see the results. Mm -hmm. If you could make plots, you could see the results at least. And the first thing I always teach is, is plots. What's been challenging is since R is so flexible and so many developers have helped shape it, uh, there's details that aren't very intuitive that students encounter. And this used to be a bigger problem in the past. But uh -huh. one function would do something one way, and you take its results and give it to a second function who should do something perhaps in the same way, but you have to do it differently, or maybe you have to munge your data, or you start using quotation marks around variable names where you didn't before. And for a brand new student, that is just a real distraction, and that distraction could be enough to prevent them from actually learning or wanting to learn the rest of R. Luckily, with, with the tidyverse and the sort of uniformity that that provides, mm -hmm. this challenge has really decreased in my teaching, and, and now we could go so fast and I could help empower students within two days to do things in R that are, are downright magical. And the frustration required to do it is not not that much harder than learning anything else. Yes, yes, it's been a huge uh, success. So that kind of it's a nice segue to my next question. But some of us in the community are working in places where we're being asked to kind of teach others about R, how best practices around it. So in general, what kind of advice can you share to others, like say in my situation or, or others, that have to teach R to people that maybe have experience in some other package, like say SAS or other you know, more point and click interfaces, because R is quite different, right? So I don't know if you have any learnings from all your experience in doing sure. that. Well, oftentimes when I see people teaching R, I could almost see their thought processes. They think, well, R is a programming language. Uh, when you learn to program, you have to learn this first, and then that first, then how to write a function, and so on and so on. And that's true, R is a programming language, but I don't think you should teach it as if you're teaching your colleagues a programming language. Sure. R is a tool for doing data science, and I think if you really want your colleagues to teach themselves after you're finished with them, and to enjoy using R, the first thing you should show them is how to make a plot, how to uh, reshape data, or maybe use dplyr to get an interesting summary out of an interesting data set. Oh, yeah. These sorts of experiences that that have immediate reward and payoff um, are the sort of things that just make students want to learn more and make them want to put in the little bit of effort that's required to learn anything. But if you start off trying to teach them how to write a for loop or something, for example, they're, they're not going to see the connection and they're going to be frustrated. Yeah, And that's, right. a, that's a bad mix. Yeah, we don't want to get frustrated around because they're, they're less likely to stick with it. Um. That's right. You know, when it comes to art, it's a tool that's incredibly useful for analyzing data because it is also a programming language. But yeah. the analyzing data comes first. Let them learn how to write programs with R as a master level thing after they got the basics down. Very, very good advice. So um, last question before we wrap up and attend the rest of the conference. Um, we've obviously seen huge advances in things like the Tidyverse and Shiny for communicating results. As you look at 2017 and beyond, do you see any areas that you think are kind of lacking in terms of you know what functionality R can bring? Um, what, what are your thoughts on that kind of? 
Well, this is something I've thought a lot about, and it's paradoxical, but I think that the modeling aspect of R needs a lot of work. People do use R because they want to do models, and R does models. And sure. you could find all sorts of models, even the latest modeling technologies are normally there in R. On the other hand, the modeling functions in R are some of the most idiosyncratic functions. Uh, what you learn for one model doesn't necessarily apply to other functions that do modeling. And I think there's quite a bit of work that is going to be done in the next year or two uh, between Hadley Wakeham and Max Kuhn mm -hmm. to standardize the modeling experience, make it fit in more with the other functions you might already be using, and just make the whole process more seamless and from a higher level, more intuitive. So you could start using functions and they work the way you'd expect, even if it's your first time using them. Very good, very good. I'm going to be watching uh, you know, Max's developments very closely because I've been a big user of, say, the carrot package in my early days of R, and I think it does have potential for tidyverse frameworks, but it's going to take some work to get there. But hey, he's a brilliant guy, and with Hadley, I think we're going to, we're going to get far there. So It's very exciting. Yeah, it is, it is. So, well, Garrett, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining me. Um, we'll definitely uh, maybe hopefully touch base again in the future. It's been great to talk with you. That sounds great. Okay, thank you, very much. thank you very much, everyone. We will be right back. Okay, I hope you really enjoyed those talks with Javier and Garrett. Um, I was really impressed with Javier's technical expertise and the work that they've done with Sparkly R. And of course, Garrett, I could listen to all day whenever he talks about his ideas of teaching R and his perspectives on data science. It's just really refreshing to hear his viewpoints. So with that, let's time to get into our package pick. Alright, so the package pick for this this episode has somewhat similar ties to what we learned at RStudioConf, and it's still, I would say, a bit early in development, but I'm already really intrigued by the possibilities, um, both for the general R community as well as just for my personal um, use with uh, this particular podcast. So Ihui Sia, who many of you should know by now, is another software engineer at RStudio who is the author of the Knitter package and our markdown. Um, he has now released a new package um, called Blogdown. Why well, it's on GitHub right now, it's not quite on CRAN yet. But the idea of Blogdown is that you're able to use the uh, Hugo uh, static site generator to produce a blog straight from our markdown. So basically, Ihue has tied together the use of Hugo with R Markdown into a very convenient R package. So you can basically automate the process of once you have a post that you want to put on your site to compile it using the Hugo engine and then being able to quickly deploy that on your web hosting of choice. So why am I really interested in this? Well. As some of you may recall, the, uh, currently um, this podcast is using a static site generator called uh, Nicola, and that's been pretty well. I mean, it's done its job. It definitely is a big improvement over WordPress. Now, it is using Python on the back end, and while I've been able to hack together a few things to make it more podcast friendly, it certainly you know, hasn't been as intuitive as I would like. And there's a bit of overhead whenever I need to post a new you know, post that, you know, publicizes a new episode. There's just a lot of steps I need to do to get it compiled, making sure there are no errors. And it's, you know, it's, it's been a good learning experience, but I'm kind of ready to try something new. Well, in my uh, podcast role, if you will, on my phone, I have listened to a, a podcast in the DevOps space called Arrested DevOps. And... What they had done in the past year is they moved their site hosting to Hugo. And so I didn't even know what Hugo was until I started, you know, hearing them talk about it. And it's Hugo is based in the Go language. Some of you may be familiar with that, but it produces a really nice, you know, attractive um, static site, has a lot of themes to choose from. But it turns out that this podcast I've been listening to, this Arrested DevOps podcast, decided to make their own podcast theme 
that would tie in with Hugo. So I'm thinking, well, finally, there's somebody out there that's made a podcast type theme for a site that's not, you know, say WordPress or anything like that. Because for the current engine I'm using, the Cola, I don't believe anybody's really used that for a podcast. And I've had a lot of trouble getting the feeds right. Some of you may have remember I was having trouble even getting the iTunes stuff right. So I'm thinking that this might be a direction I want to pursue. So I've, I've had this in the back of my mind for a little bit, but then I had the chance to talk with Ihue at our studio conf about his current developments with blog down. And I mentioned that I had my eye on, you know, I'm using this for the podcast and he's been very receptive to help me throughout the process. If I have any issues with using uh, blog down during this. So I'm waiting on one key um, fix from the, from the author of this uh, podcast theme on Hugo. Um, and he's he's got to fix a little issue with basically in these sites you have you know like a navigation bar at the top and for whatever reason that in the latest version of hugo that just simply disappeared even with his example that i copied straight through um so i'm kind of got an issue with i filed an issue on his um github tracker for the for the theme so i'm just kind of waiting to see what progress he makes to fix that and then once that's ready to go I got a theme in Hugo. I got, you know, blog down already installed on my system. I've been, you know, just messing with it a little bit, just some basic R markdown files. But the reason I'm really happy with this is that I could literally do all of the publishing of my episodes, aside from the recording of the episodes themselves, um, straight through R in our studio. I mean, how cool is that? So I can't guarantee it's going to go 100% smoothly, but it's definitely something I'm attracted with um, trying out. And hopefully it is um, a good experience. And later this year that you'll see a new version of the site that's completely produced from R. So we'll see what happens. But um, uh, Eway is already getting some really nice feedback on, on blog down. I've seen in the in the Twitter feed for R stats that there's been a few people that have been posting their new blogs on um, using blog down. So it's already getting some traction. So I'm really interested to see where it goes. So I'll have a link to the blog down GitHub repo in the, in the show notes, if you want to check it out. All right. Well, I think that's going to wrap up episode 20. Um, As always, if you want to provide any feedback on this episode or even previous episodes or the podcast in general, you have a few ways of doing that. So first, if you go to our home site, that's www.r-podcast.org, go ahead and click the contact link at the upper um, navigation bar, and you'll be given a very simple contact form that you can fill out, which will automatically send me an email so that I can get your feedback right away. And if you prefer just sending an email, you can do so at drcast at gmail.com. And then we also have a voicemail hotline that you can find the number for that in the, our podcast site. And then also you can leave a comment on this episode directly on the episode post um, on our site. And again, I want to thank everybody for the great feedback on episode 19. It's great to get back into this. And you, you real, I realize I haven't really addressed why it took so long to get back into it from the coverage of Shiny DevCon. Um, Basically, I'm going to have to change my my uh, production I- ideas a little bit to make sure I can get these out on a regular basis. But I think I've got a system working and um, I'm going to do my best to give you more interviews with uh, members of the R community. And um, stay tuned for episode 21. I got one more great interview from our studio comp from one of the um, leading um, our community members that I've followed for a long time and who also happens to be a very uh, passionate Linux user. So you'll just have to stay tuned for that. All right, that's going to wrap up episode 20. And until next time. End of line.